Their son, Alexei, had inherited the bleeding disease, haemophilia. Their four daughters, Maria, Tatiana, Olga and Anastasia, were all fine, healthy young women. But they couldn't inherit the imperial throne. Only Alexei, Victoria's great-grandson, who had to be carried everywhere for fear of an accident which might start the bleeding, could inherit the throne and continue Victoria's dynasty. Alexandra, in desperation, turned to a healer called Rasputin. He had somehow a power to calm this boy, to help this boy when he was ill. This gave Rasputin a great influence over Alexandra, and in many ways has coloured the history of Russia towards the end of the regime. So, straight through to your first position. Stephen Polyakov is interested in the close relationship between the two families, especially the relationship between the two cousins, Georgie and Nikki. In this scene, the Russian imperial family comes to the Isle of Wight for another royal gathering to meet their cousins, sail their yachts, drink tea and speak English. Action! There was a general intermingling of the two families and there was a famous photograph of George and um, the Russians are um, taken together, They're linked in a strangely awkward, rather touching pose, rather haunting that, um, you know, only six, seven years later, he was going to um, not come to his cousin's rescue. It was a very close relationship, King George V and the Tsar Nicholas II, their mothers were sisters. They both had um, these little beards, they both had rather protruding blue eyes, and that way they were, in many ways, very alike. The other cousin who never missed the family gathering at Cowes was Willy, the German Kaiser. But Willy wasn't one of the popular members of the family. He was a neurotic man, suffering from a kind of megalomania. Everything German had to be bigger and better. Willy wanted an empire like his cousins Georgie and Nicky, and his palace at Potsdam would be the great centerpiece. Willie was born with a withered arm, and whether it was this or his difficult relationship with his mother, Vicky, Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, which helped give him his inferiority complex, it's difficult to tell. But by the time he was in his teens, he was obsessed with everything military, everything his parents hated. He very much loved dressing up. He, d he dressed up all the time. He was always asking if they went out um, what other uniform he should wear. and. Um, there, there were uh, thousands of photographs taken of him in different positions and in different uniforms with all sorts of ruffles and wigs and all sorts of things. He was a born actor. He loved it. Everything he did was like going on stage. He was a kind of braggart. He was a, a show-off. They say that he wanted to be the, the bride at every wedding. He wanted to be a corpse at every funeral. He simply always wanted to hold the centre of attention. in power, Willie's megalomania knew no bounds. He already had the might of the Prussian army behind him, but now he began to build up his navy as well, determined to challenge Britain's mastery of the seas. He was now the Kaiser, he was in power and he could finally live all his lavishness and all his power he had ever dreamed of. He, he built palaces which were so sumptuous and lavish one can't even imagine. He bought a luxury yacht he liked to um, sail on, which was with lo a lot of white and gold. He got a lot of shooting kit um, to go hunting, and he loved his parades. He got a royal train, everything that goes with a big pompous pageant, really. He was the main actor in it. His palace at Potsdam had 84 bedrooms. It was centrally heated and had electric lighting throughout. The ensuite bathrooms had hot and cold running water. All he needed now was a grand occasion to show it all off. The wedding of his daughter, Princess Victoria Louise, in 1913, 
was the perfect opportunity. The royal mob descended on Germany in their royal yachts and their royal trains, delighted to celebrate yet another suitable marriage. But George V and Queen Mary had been firmly told by their government that this could only be a private visit, a family affair, and in no sense a state visit. Willie really might be a cousin. He was making too many warlike noises for the British government's liking. So the emperors and empresses, royal and serene highnesses, dukes and archdukes, crown princes and princesses, paraded and celebrated and feasted. Later they danced and twirled together in the grand ballroom. How could they know that this would be the last dance, the end of an era, the end of Victoria's dynastic dream? It was Lord Stamfordham, his private secretary, played here by Bill Nye. Lord Stamfordham was the perfect courtier, discreet, urbane, and utterly loyal. Queen Victoria had personally selected him because she could be sure Stamfordham would know how to offer discreet help where it was needed. He was the man that George V did once describe as the person who had taught him how to be king. His job was to remain passive and to be unreadable a great deal of the time. War was in the air. An anxious George wrote from Windsor Castle to his cousin Nicky in St. Petersburg. Windsor Castle, June 16, 1914. My dearest Nicky, you will remember the very satisfactory conversations we had last year in Berlin, when we both so entirely agreed upon the great importance of maintaining the most friendly relations between our two countries. I confess that I feel so anxious upon this subject that I write this private letter to explain what is causing me this anxiety. I remain always your devoted old friend and cousin, Georgie. Back in the city of London, Stephen Polyakov is filming another scene at Buckingham Palace, which shows that whilst George may have been worried about a possible war with Europe in July 1914, he was much more worried about a problem a lot nearer home, Ireland. This is the Irish conference that happened at Buckingham Palace, uh, I thought it was very interesting that something that still haunts us was very much on their minds at that precise moment, just at the point when the Western world was going to go completely mad. The place the world went mad was the Balkans, at Sarajevo, the capital of a region called Bosnia. On the 28th of June, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, went on a royal visit. As he and his wife sat side by side in a car greeting the public, a man leapt out and shot them. It was a Bosnian Serb, fighting for Bosnia to be given back to Serbia. If you lost your heir to the throne, as Austria has, you feel you have to do something. So you declare war on who you imagine is responsible, Serbia. But you don't really mean it. How can you not really mean it? All the Austrian generals are on holiday. So are the German generals. And so are we. Absolutely. You don't declare war when everyone's on holiday and not have them return. So it's purely for show. And that's how it will stay. Just so long as Russia doesn't get everybody excited, doesn't decide to mobilize its army to come to the aid of Serbia. Well, this is a scene where the Russian Tsar um, mobilizes the Russian army on the eve of the First World War. And in his diary, he makes no mention of mobilizing the Russian army. But um, it does record his swim in detail, and um, it's a very important image 
for the story. And so the Russian army was mobilized. But behind the scenes, the royal cousins were keeping in touch. Before the war was actually declared, the Kaiser, the Tsar, and George V, they're writing frantically telegrams to each other in the hope that they could somehow stop the war happening. They assumed that as they were all cousins, they could somehow uh, bring a certain influence to bear that turned out to be nonsense because they had no personal power anymore, but there's something which they didn't actually realize at the time. August 4th, Buckingham Palace. I hold a council at 10.45 to declare war with Germany. It is a terrible catastrophe, but it is not... An enormous crowd collected outside the palace. We went on the balcony both before and after dinner. The cheering was terrific. In the first few days, thousands of young men volunteered to fight the Hun, not thinking perhaps that the Hun was doing the same. And so was the Russian. And so was the Frenchman. Now the whole of Europe lined up for war. Germany, supporting Austro-Hungary, declared war on Serbia and Montenegro. When Russia came to Serbia's aid, Germany declared war on Russia as well. Two days later, Germany declared war on Russia's ally, France. On the 4th of August, when Germany invaded Belgium, Britain entered the war. And so began a war more terrible than anyone could have imagined. A war which was meant to last no more than a few months, but went on for four interminable years. Four years of trenches, four years of mud, four years of gaining a few hundred yards of French soil and then losing it again. Four years of maiming and blinding and gassing and death. I think that uh, George V found visits to the troops anguishing. I think he really felt the strain because he knew what was going on. He could read the casualty lists. He wrote to Queen Mary once saying, if it were not for your support, I think I would have had a breakdown. Yeah, look straight towards... Yeah. Queen Mary found her own way of helping the war effort. She went to many, many hospitals, literally hundreds of hospital visits, sometimes three or four during one day. And she was very distressed by what she saw. Um, she recalled in her diary how pitiful it was to see the men's injuries. Um, this did not mean that she questioned, obviously, the war or why they were fighting it. And quite the contrary, I think it reinforced her determination that, that we should win it. We commend you for your service. Just to be a royal presence, uh, like a sort of ministering angel, was the hope. Visiting these incredibly young men, some of whom have had devastating injuries. And I think for many people it probably did have a profound effect. <laughs> As the war went into the second terrible year, and then the third, life at the front got worse and worse. The generals on both sides found it hard to change tactics. It was stalemate. The war could not be won, they thought, unless you hurled enormous numbers of men against each other in the trenches on, on the Western Front. Hundreds of thousands of, of, of casualties marked every big battle, at the Battle of Luce, Battle of the Somme, Passchendaele. I mean, absolutely tragic. 